Okay, so thank you for, for joining us today. Today, uh, we are looking at uh, what the CEO report says about uh, education and training, and also its implications for, for places like Leicester. The event is taking place as part of the eighth annual Leicester Human Rights Arts and Film Festival. The Leicester Human Rights Arts and Film Festival aims to draw attention to human rights issues at home and abroad. And it also aims to draw attention to Human Rights Day, which is celebrated annually around the world on December 10. For the event that we are gathered for today, we have got uh, three speakers. How we are going to proceed is we'll start with uh, Stephanie, Stephanie Orisakwe, and then we'll hear from Julie Nisbet. Uh, the speakers will introduce themselves and then say, talk about what the CEO report says about education and training. Uh, they will speak for about six minutes. And then after that, we go into a, a conversation or Q&A session. Uh, without more from me, I will, we go over to Stephanie. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm going to share my screen because I had uh, made a slide. So, um, okay. So my name is Stephanie Orisakwe and I don't know if you can see my screen. And I've got, my first degree was in law. So I've got LLB, then I've got a master's in science in social work and I've recently just completed my master's in international education and development at University of Success. Um, I had done my research as part of my um, program on looking at, I was exploring um, Black parents' experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic and how the strategies that they used to ensure that their children were still learning because we all know that with the lockdown and everything, a lot of children um, were, you know, there were lots of learning. So that was what my um, research was on. Then as I was actually writing the dissertation, that was when um, I'm thinking of writing it, that was when the sewer report um, came out. So um, I looked at the report and basically, you know, it says there was no institutional racism in the UK. And the report obviously was um, came about following the uproar about the George Floyd um, death in the USA and the pandemic that was killing a lot of black um, people um, in the UK. Then when that report came out, I knew that it caused a lot of uproar amongst my community, amongst um, my friends and everybody. And, you know, a lot of charity organizations, you know, felt that the report was, um, you know, the progress that had been made in terms of addressing the racial inequality in the UK, um, you know, that has just been taken away because people felt hurt and betrayed about their experiences, um, you know, and what they're experiencing in the um, UK. Then in terms of what the report was saying, the report obviously said that the UK is a more open society where race and racism are turning out to be less important for a defined, the constant and less inequalities. You know, so the key argument in the CIWA report on education was that the educational outcome of people is not as a result of their ethnic ba um, background, that people from the BME background are outdoing their white British counterparts. However, I felt that what the report failed to address was the real issues and role that racism plays when it comes to the life chances of BME students in the UK. 
Also, the report did not address evidences and statistics that are out there which have shown how racism functions at all levels, including within the classroom, even through policies and practices within the schools. For example, teachers from BME backgrounds, you know, report explicit and systemic racism regularly from the research that I had done. And BME students are more likely than their whiter counterparts to be excluded from schools in the UK. And also teachers' inability to deal with issues of overt racism experienced by students from the BME background. And you then look at the recommendations. So the re report made 24 recommendations, which when you look at them, I found some of them really very useful. However, I think that the report did not look at the inequality within the teaching um, profession. Because when you look at um, the teaching profession as a whole, the BME, um, communities are underrepresented within the teaching profession in the UK, then the government statistics reporting that it is 5.7% of teachers are white and 92.3% of the head teachers in the UK are also from white background. And as a social worker in the UK, working with a lot of young black children in the UK who are dropping out of school and everything, and some of them, when you talk to them about their decision about education and why they're dropping out of school. It always comes down to people not believing them. People don't trust them. People put them down, people undermining them. So it's made their experience of education really very poor. And a lot of them do drop out of um, education and end up in crime. And uh, a lot of them will say, well, they don't have people that look like them in school talking to them you know, about, you know, trying to inspire them and everything. So I then said that in order to address the, you know, discrimination and the inequalities that exist within education, I think effort needs to be put into addressing the shortage of BME teachers within schools in the UK. Then I looked at a lot, some studies that I had looked at when I was doing my um, dissertation. So the YMCA had, done a study in 2020 and found that 95% of young black children have experienced racism in schools in the UK. And disturbingly, some of these young black people have expressed that they expect to face racism at some point in their lives due to their skin color. The study also found that most young people from BME background express that racial stereotype experience in schools have negative impact on their future opportunities and development with 49% citing racism as the reason for their low academic attainment. Then I looked at some case studies as well when I was doing my research. I saw the case study of Shukri, the young refugee girl from Somali who had been bullied at school. And there were concerns that the school did not respond to the bullying concerns, even though they were aware of it. Then during the inquest into her death, evidence then showed that the family were right to doubt the school and the, policy, the police um, dismissal of racism because the, the racism all allegations against um, Shukri. Then when you look at um, Shukri, it's, her death is one of too many deaths because of racism and shows the realities of racism in schools. Then we had the nine-year-old um, Caleb. Then when you look at hair policies as well, this has been found to be very problematic. You know, equality campaigners have voiced um, concerns about the street policies on hair and at schools, which have resulted in exclusion for some young people from the BME um, communities. Then the same YMCA study found that 70% of participants who took part in the study said that they had been under pressure and had to adjust the texture of their hair so that they can be accepted in school. Some children have reported being excluded or given a or giving detention due to their haircuts and hairstyles. So 
and I was reading another report. Um, I think that was in the Guardian. I've put the reference there, which is in my dissertation, but it was an educational psychologist um, who said that sometimes some of the issues, you know, when um, schools make referrals to them, trying to get educational psychologists um, involved in children's lives, that they, she's found that some of the issues about maintaining eye contact, which you know, is seen as a trait of um, autism in, for a white European student. However, these traits could be as a result of the family's culture or you know, some of their values um, you know, or how they are brought up. So then you then talk up, um, she then talk about um, the children from BME background who attend school that, that are predominantly white can sometimes feel unnoticed, disregarded and overlooked. And the long-term impact is low self-esteem and suicidal ideation. Then I looked at the barriers for um, black students in education. So when you talk about negative perception from teachers, which can have a negative impact um, on the educational outcomes of people from BME um, communities, most of black students that I work with, they said that you know, it, most of their teachers already have a view of them due to the societal stereotypes that are out there. Then most of them report that teachers don't tend not to encourage encourage them to go for their dreams and tend to limit them. In my dissertation, I had cited some studies and personal experiences as well um, in my studies about this, you know, where teachers, some black children will have big dreams and the teachers will just um, put it down. Then issue of diversity within the teaching profession. So the data from the Department of Education in 2018 showed that 92% of teachers in state-funded schools in England were white. Only 3% of head teachers are reported to be from the BMA communities. Then I feel that having teachers from BMA communities will assist in raising aspirations of young people from BMA communities within schools and will help in terms of their academic attainment. Then you look at the stark differences in university type. Most black people that I speak to, they don't aim for the top universities because they feel that they won't be accepted there. Most of them tend to go for, you know, just a university where they feel that they will fit in and that they will be accepted. And even some of the degrees that, uh, um, that they do, then, when they eventually go to university, most people from the black um, communities tend, are most likely to drop out of schools compared to their white counterparts. Then you then look at COVID, the impact of COVID, the school lockdown was as a result to contain um, the COVID-19 um, virus. And a lot of children were then left at home to to be studied and um, to be studying at home. When you look at that, that was going to have more sets, um, impact on children from the BMA community because a lot of them are from disadvantaged background. Then I was, most of them don't have the spaces where, you know, for the, um, for the study, for their studies and their parents um, don't have the qualities um, and the skills to be able to teach them um, at home. Some of the children I was working with, their parents literally didn't know where to um, start and they didn't even have the money to like get um, extra tuition in place. And some of these children, even the schools provided um, packs, learning packs um, to them, but they didn't know where to go. And I know a parent that literally just left it by the side and said, well, I don't know what to do with this. Um, um, learning packs. So, um, and some parents are not familiar with the education system in the UK. So they had that struggle. And what, as, a, as a result of this, these children are then left behind without anybody teaching them and schools are in lockdown. And I know the government made provisions for children because um, I know where I work, you know, children that had social workers were encouraged to go into school. But with the 
the death rate that was being reported at the time of black people being affected by COVID and a lot of them were dying and everything. Most parents I worked with refused to send their children to school. They would rather have the children at home and they refused to go out because they felt that it was safer for them to remain at home than being out there then catch COVID and bring it um, back. So then I said, you know, I would then look at what can be done, you know, cultural issues. I do think that because in social work, we use something that is called social graces. We have to look at um, the way you work with this family is not the way you're going to work with this family. So you need to look at their circumstances. You need to look at their culture. You need to look at religion. You need to look at some of the practices of that family to see what is happening in that family, then be able to see the kind of support that you're going to put in place. Um, you know, for that family to be able to effect um, positive changes. So I did say that I think when, if we, in terms of education, if cultural issues and practices are understood, then appropriate um, support will be put in place instead of disempowering parents. Because I know some referrals that we receive, um, you know, in social services, when you look at some of the referrals, then you see that some of them are actually cultural, and um, practices happening within the home. So I do think that sometimes educating parents might help instead of trying to disempower them. Then that trust as well, you know, building trust between young people from um, BME um, communities and authorities, especially police, you know, because I've had a young man say to me, I behave the way I behave because I keep getting arrested from the police. He doesn't open up, you know, he continues to engage in crime and everything, you know, but he feels that because nobody listens to him, that's why he behaves the way he behaves. Then also selective and top universities to establish cultures where black and other ethnic minority young people can be supported when they arrive. Um, appreciating and acknowledging and trend biases in their course, in the, in the curriculum and student support as well. Um, you know, I can send this slide to you later on, you know, where I've made, and my dissertation as well, I had made some um, recommendations as well, which I'm happy to um, share some of the, my thoughts in my dissertation. But yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much, Stephanie. And then we'll hear from Julie next. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is uh, Julie Walters Nisbet, and I am a Black science teacher here in Leicester. I am the second Black president of the Leicester City NEU. Um, I've taught less science here in Leicester for the last 20 years, and I'm a part of the NEU Black Teacher Organising Group. Okay. Um, last year during lockdown, I spent some of my time working on my dissertation, finishing my master's, looking at um, how young black men in particular in Leicester City, and I had the perfect case study right here in my own house, um, achieve success. And as I said to Ambrose, it was surprisingly quite difficult to find 10 young black men who'd achieved the five GCSEs um, um, academic success as we would expect here in Leicester, okay? So like I said, I've used my um, Leicester Black Teacher Network um, and we secured interviews with 10 successful young black, young black men that I will share during the presentation. So let's go back to the Sewell report. From the Sewell report, one of the recommendations was to replicate the educational success that was achieved by all communities and invest in meaningful and substantial research to understand and replicate the underlying factors that drive success of high performing groups. Now, one could argue that we've had lots and lots of research into factors that contribute into high performing groups. Um, and I actually chose to focus on the success of our own um, Leicester African Caribbean community. My union um, quite likely put out a response on the 18th of April and said that 
actually the Sewell report had very little to say about education and none of its um, recommendations actually tackled racism in school. And I know that lots of the media talked about the fact that, you know, the Sewell report seemed to dismiss the concept of institutional racism in schools. The union acknowledged from the research it's already carried out that black children often face obstacles, both in terms of racism and the other in terms of poverty, but social class alone can't be the defining factor for the lack of success, okay? In talking to my colleagues and my students, because that's the kind of person that I am, um, it's felt that we need to acknowledge the fact that, you know, you don't get social mobility without education. And if we can't overcome that basics of five GCSEs to begin with, then access to further education and higher education, as Stephanie gave a nod to, becomes more and more difficult. You know, there's a whole book range about slaying my lane. Even at my um, secondary and tertiary school here in Leicester, we find it really hard to get our young people to apply to Russell Group universities because they want to go where they'll feel comfortable and welcome. The union also gave a nod to the fact that the exclusion rates for Black Caribbean students in English schools continue to be up to six times higher than their white peers in some local authorities. That data has been proven time and time again. And as a Black teacher here in Leicester, yes, we do have several minority ethnic communities. One would even go so far as to say we've got a global majority, haven't we, of people from other countries and heritage. But I still experience on a day to day these sorts of stereotypes. And in talking to one of my most successful Black boys today, he also gave a nod to the fact that every time he walks into a room, he feels that he has to prove himself twice as much as everybody else in the room. There was one photographer last year during the lockdown who did a display of black boys smiling to try and dispel the myths, yes. And yes, our Asian children here in Leicester also experience racism, but because of the networks and the, and the employability networks, it means that they don't end up as disadvantaged as our black African heritage pupils. More recently in Leicester, we've also seen, and across nationally, and there was actually um, a BBC nod to this back in September about students being off-rolled, okay? Lots of parents were quite rightly worried about um, corona and its effect on the family, especially where you have three generational homes. And after a while, it was encouraged for these students to become homeschooled. Um, and actually, I've been involved in webinars in Birmingham where there's a big movement by Black families to take up homeschooling. Here in Leicester, we've started to see young people being moved to SEN schools. Um, some of our local SEN schools have actually Sorry, some of our local behaviour schools have actually become SEN schools as well over the last few years, okay, where, where again we are overrepresenting. So going back to the scrutiny report of 2019 by Leicester City Council, only 21% of Black Caribbean boys achieve strong passes in English and maths here in Leicester City, okay? We've asked for time and time again, the updated data for 2020 and 2021, even though they are teacher assessed grades. So nationally, you know, there were concerns about those building upon those neg negative stereotypes. Now, 21% pass rate when the national average is in the mid forties is still far too low. We are affecting the life chances of these individuals and the chances of them going on to further education or higher education um, decrease rapidly. The NEU also talks about the research by the TUC that says the unemployment rate for Indian, Pakistani and Bangladeshi groups is around 10% higher than for white groups and black African and Caribbean groups. And black African and Caribbean groups are twice as more likely to be unemployed than their white counterparts. So going back to this concept of social class, 
Um, there are many studies proving that whilst black boys and white boys in schools may leave with the lack of same lack of GCSEs, because of the network systems that our white boys have in terms of um, achieving a trade and working in a family business and working with uncles and so forth, that they manage to make up for earnings far more quicker than our black boys do. So finally, the NEU recommended that we start to look at reviewing the curriculum like it was nodded to back in the McPherson report so many years ago, and that in fact, the British curriculum, especially with the revision of the national curriculum in 2010, is still rooted in um, sort of monocultural, you know, black British values-based education. Um, and one of the things that we've been working on here in Leicester City, um, in conjunction with the Phoenix Agenda Supplementary School, is working with the Leicester City Council to use some of the resources um, made originally by Hackney Council, actually, and adapting them to our context, okay? Focusing in on English, history, and science, we're trying to get the council to ask their schools, because Leicester is still very much a LEA-based um, school area compared to some of our um, home counties and central London and Birmingham, et cetera. And these are materials that the Phoenix Supplementary School have been using since 2021. Now, the Phoenix Supplementary School was restarted in 2019 to help to try and get rid of some of this underachievement in our black boys here in Leicester City. So we ask kindly that our LEA continue to hold our head teachers to account because ultimately our LEA bears responsibility for all education here in Leicester City, apart from those that have obviously been academized. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, thank you very much, Julie. Uh, one of uh, the ways in which uh, the current government responded to Black Lives Matter was to institute this commission, the Commission of Inquiry, which covered uh, things like uh, policing, health, and also education and training. In your, in your view, how has Black Lives Matter as a movement affected education? And uh, also was uh, the government's response to that adequate? Was it useful? When you're ready. Sorry, I am. Um... Are you asking whether the government's response to the sewer report, whether that was useful? Uh, I, I, I've taken it uh, you know, a step back, where one of the sewer report itself was a, a response to Black Lives Matter, to how the, the movement was being experienced in the UK. Mm. And then the government responded by encouraging uh, the sewer report. So. The question I'm asking is, you know, was that response adequate in your view? Did it respond the way that it should? Um, I will say um, in terms of commissioning the, um, the, you know, asking the commissioners to undertake this, um, you know, um, investigation and everything, I, I thought, it was, but I guess what happened was what happened during the investigation and how it was conducted um, really and who was spoken to. And I don't think that they looked at the statistics. I don't think that they looked at, cause that report would have been very useful because it was at the height of when emotions were running very high. Um, that report would have been very useful if due diligence had been done. And if, you know, it had looked at people's experiences adequately, if he had looked at statistics, if it had looked at people's experiences as well um, adequately. And that's why when that report was published, it, it caused a lot of negative reactions actually, because it had not done what it was supposed to do. How about you, Julie? What do you think? Oh. <laughs> um, it, it took a 
took us back um, some 20, 25 years, if I'm honest. Um, it, it shifted the blame to class as opposed to racism. Our children now were armed with the vocabulary and felt that they could speak up about their everyday racism experiences. Um, and then it tried to take it back to social class. Um, my union in response have developed an anti-racism charter, which can be used by schools. And this was in response to the murder of George Floyd. Um, I'm just going to show you it briefly. And it asks schools to look at employment. It asks schools to look at the way that racist incidents are recorded um, and definitely trying to adapt an anti-racist approach within education, okay? I felt that it's led to some very topical debate. It's led to us being able to question the training of governing bodies, the training of head teachers, you know, um, Unfortunately, like Stephanie, I feel like the Sewell report took us backwards, okay? It failed to acknowledge the experience of the children. And, you know, our children very much still talk about negative experiences. Unfortunately, some of their parents still talk about negative experiences in, in school. And um, I think it was in October, it was the 50th anniversary of the Bernard Cord report about how um, West Indian children were made to feel educationally subnormal, and yet still we, we're having those experiences today in 2021. And, you know, um, Mr. Cord said, quite frankly, you know, it's time we had our own schools because our children are not being catered for, they're not feeling empowered. Um, you should not have that negative everyday drip drip experience where the high expectations aren't expected of yourself, where, you know, where you're stereotyped and, you know, being a mother <laughs> of twins, I had boy girl twins here in Leicester, so I had the direct experiment, um, they did their GCSEs last year and I was able to see the way that um, our boys are still treated. They're not allowed to stand around in groups. Um, people expect negatives from them. They don't expect them to be so articulate. You know, my son was fighting really hard to get his seven in English. I think his teacher was quite astounded by that. Um, and as parents, we need to take back the education of our children. I talked to lots of parents who have sent their children to outstanding schools and academies and feel that they're okay now, they're okay. It's okay, he's in a good school, they say to me. And then we get to year 11 and they're like, no, it's not happening, miss. I thought he was doing this, you know, children are overgraded, children aren't engaged. Um, they, they feel disillusioned with the curriculum. And they're quite often not presented with positive mold models. I was talking to Stephanie just before the chat and she was saying her children have never been taught like a black teacher. You know, Diane Abbott said, you can't be what you can't see. So unless you're seeing those positive role models all the time, I was fortunate enough to have my formative education in the Caribbean. So my doctors, my lawyers, my accountants were all black. So were my teachers. Um, and we need to show other people how to have those high expectations of our, of our children. So unfortunately, I too felt it was a negative report in that it shifted the blame from racism to class. So in, in your view, what, what, what should be done, especially in, in places like, uh, like Leicester, where uh, I think we are the first plural city in Europe where there's no one group that forms more than 51% of the population. What, 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 can we, what, can, what can be done to ensure that uh, the education system that we have works for all? Um, I know that some of my colleagues are currently working on research, looking at how we get more black leadership into schools here in Leicester. So the reports from the 80s said there were no black teachers. We've proved that there are now black teachers, but we're very much on the front line with the interface with students. And we now need to see representation further up so that we can be involved in, ch in changing policy and, and um, making sure that it's representative of our young people, you know, so that the one boy going to Cambridge isn't the rare occurrence 
but the norm, there are some schools in South London where 40 and 50 students this summer have gone off to Oxbridge um, type and, and it's the norm to apply for a Russell's group. I do think in Leicester, our children want to keep their costs down. And that's why the introduction of university fees was always gonna hit us harder than, than other groups, but we need to be getting into spaces. We need to organize. We need to make sure we're represented in the governing body. Yes, that we're getting on these exec boards of the new academies, that as parents, we are mobilizing in different areas in primary schools, et cetera, so that our young people can feel empowered and supported by us, as well as us challenging the system. Thank you. And, and Stephanie, what, what do you think? Yeah, you're on mute. Yeah, I agree with what um, Julie has just said now. Even like, even me as a parent, I grew up in um, outside of, you know, I grew up in Africa where there was representation. I had lawyers, I had doctors, I had engineers. You know, as a young girl, I knew that I could achieve anything I wanted to achieve. But I, you know, I've had my children in this country and seeing that there's no represent, um, present, representation is really difficult because, okay, even you as a parent, you know, sometimes you're telling your kids, you know, what to do and how to, you know, um, achieve, but it's a different message for them at schools. So it is very difficult, um, you know, when there's no consistency in discussions that are being held with the children, um, in school and what's being held at home is very, very difficult. I do think that it's very crucial that we have representation across the board, people that in terms of key stakeholders, decision makers and everybody, because it's going to help a lot of our young black children when they see people that look like them, then they will aim very high, then they will aim to achieve what that person has achieved. And it is a lot of hard work actually, because you know some of some people, especially the people I work with, they don't have families that they can look up to. They don't have you know, people that they can look up to. Most of them, their parents haven't gone to um, education they would have been the first generation to achieve um, education. And, you know, if they don't have people that will motivate them, if they don't have people that will push them, if they don't have people encouraging them, then they're not going to be able to achieve. So that's why it's very, very crucial that we have that representation is very, very important across the board. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, uh, if, we we hear from councillor pandya next the several report education and training the report makes 24 recommendations to address ethnic disparities the i'll say a few bullet points first because the leicester city has got so many good talents and I really wanted to say a few, like the, um, it's like the um, recommendations touches on education and training, um, employment and fairness at work, crime and policing, health as well. Obviously, we've got a very big city and we've got so many different um, people living all together. So the data from British polling suggests that race um, re relations have got improved over the past five, 50 years, if I say past 50 years. This means various um, cultures are coming together and showing their talents. As I was discussing a while ago that we've got so many um, young people here and they have got really good talents into their uh, lives and the culture. 
And I really like to say that, yes, it's not that just one community or a one person. There's so many different people have got different talents. And really, if I say the Leicester is a, a classic example for a rise of activities, which I really would say that they have got um, local Asian and African radios, TV stations, especially if I say an Asian TV called an MA TV, a local station, was born in Leicester first. Asian Mela, like Caribbean, um, Carnival, um, Leicester, uh, Leicester um, Comedy Festival involves uh, many local talents like Diwali celebration, um, Navrati festival, which are the Hindu festival, also Eid celebration, um, Beshaki celebration. Obviously we've got Chinese New Year and Christmas uh celebrations as well so this is already happening successfully in leicester and let's hope it still works even better and further um i'm very very happy to say that we all celebrate to each other's festival all together like getting dinner lifestyle um each other's new years and so on so I'm really, really happy to um, successfully happening those things. And also this is already happening, but the activity still needs more support. Although the um, local council and the police, fire, business communities and local organizations are helping each other. The council offers grants to such celebrations those activities are there but those activities still needs more support and educational um, i would say establishments eg university universities needs more development projects training um, if I say um, organizations are still varieties and achievements more efficiently and um, sufficiently. They are um, giving so many different um, people a good chance and local drama artists needs more um, good academically qualifications and journalists needs more um, Asian African uh, influence to enhance it um, reflects local um, culture community and languages as well. We still need more education. If I say more education, um, different languages, different talents, different um, culture are getting all together as well. I really like to say that yes we have got that sort of challenge into us and we still need more to be support us from varieties of backgrounds because obviously um, we were may, many people were born as probably you have i have born in, in in england as well and then i went back to india for my education and i came back again and that's how I've been living in, 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 in this Leicester, if I say. Um, a few years I've educated myself in Peterborough, but mainly I've been living in Leicester since 1976. So I know Leicester very well. And I know since I've started living and today, it's totally changed and and as being a counselor, I've been looking at everybody's situation, everybody's helping each other, you know, very friendly. 
and they have got many su um, suggestions as well. I would say, yes, they still need um, multiple cultural people, a good training and support. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Pandi. So what, what we've just said are, are some of the things that work about Leicester, some of the things that uh, we, we celebrate about Leicester. But then what we also know about this city is that uh, the, there is a, we, we know that uh, institutional racism is, is, is alive and well in Leicester. And uh, we see this when we look at, at, at employment and unemployment, where if we look at uh, Leicester City Council itself, we look at who it employs and who it doesn't employ, we find that it privileges, as a city mm. council, Leicester privileges whiteness. You know, we know these things. Uh, looking at, at education, we've just said that uh, if you are black and you are in Leicester, and you are uh, a boy, you are more likely to be excluded than if you're white. You know, what is the sense that you get from sitting in the relevant scrutiny panel about what Leicester City Council is doing about these problems, especially around education? Um. There are quite a few issues, yes, but they can be um, resolved. And um, also I will support as well as within my limit. But yes, there are quite a few um, complaints when we um, have them as well. But eventually it's been resolved. I've had quite a few um, problems I think it was August time in in Judge Meadow School. We've got a Judge Meadow School here, and because I am in an education scrutiny in in council, and we've all um, got together, had a good meeting, and it was been resolved. So, on one hand or one side, it's raised or it's created and on second hand or second side it's been resolved. So we have to get together. Julie and uh, Stephanie, what do you think? Um, with each cohort comes a different set of issues. Um, we're finding that year sevens because of the two years in lockdown and lots of screen time, that you know they're exhibiting quite mature behaviors um you know some of which was unmonitored by by parents and going forward you know we're seeing lots of needs for counseling our school counselor is already full we know that cams is full and got a very long waiting list um and we really do need to support activities that will get the young people outside exercising you know releasing those endorphins as well as the sort of national tuition catch-up program. Our young people leave a lot more nurture than in previous years. You know, we're seeing in primary schools, they're not speaking because they've been in the house. Mom and dad have been working on laptops, you know, the scenarios. So we, you know, we need to encourage our young people to get out and have opportunities for oratory learning, for speaking and sharing and listening. You know, the, the erosions of things like guides and scouts. I know some of them were trying to do it on Zoom, but, you know, lots of those missed opportunities in a social sense over the last 18 months have meant that our young people, uh, are, some of them are too advanced for their age, and some of them aren't advanced enough in terms of speech, language, and communication. Um, and there needs to be an investment to, you know, to catch them up on their social skills as well as their education. And Stephanie? Yeah, it's really the same. Like, you know, um, a lot of the resources out, out there, the, the, there's no capacity. Camps really, they don't actually take any referrals um, again from us. Um, you know, the impact 
of COVID, I think is going to take a while. We're going to see it for a very, very, very long time. Um, you know, most of, we are not even only talking about loss of learning. We're even talking about emotional well-being. Um, most um, of these children don't have, they, you know, they were not able to play outside um, during the COVID. So there is a lot of negative impact which we are going to see in years to come. And with the resources not being available, is actually going to have adverse effect on most of these children. And I think it's going to take a while to be able to pick up the pieces from the impact of COVID. And then one of uh, the uh, things that uh, the report mentions is, uh, you know, progression from, from, uh, from high school to university. But, at the same time that it mentions that it, uh, the report, I don't think it mentions at all the, the almost Jim Crow-esque operations of uh, the student loan company, which is making it very difficult for some students who are eligible for student loans to actually get those loans, where the student loan company asks for a phenomenal amount of information with the result that uh, sometimes students start university, but then uh, end up withdrawing or are deferred because the student loan company is not processing uh, their, their applications for student finance on time. Uh, in your view, what should be done about, about things like that. Um, the, uh, the introduction of university fees was meant to keep certain people in their place, wasn't it? Let's be honest. And what it has done is, um, like um, Stephanie alluded to earlier, I still teach children who would be the first to go to university in their families. And we're talking about second and third generation black children. Yes. Um, the, so the introduction of the fees was all about stopping social mobility um, as a result of education. Um, interestingly, the young man I mentioned earlier um, said that he's been offered a partial scholarship to Warwick University, which would also be a, a local Russell Group University. And it's about us encouraging him to take that brave step. Um, in actually, in the book Slay in the Lane, it talks about how um, the black students in Warwick all got together, you know, and would cook together to have some solidarity together and to lift one another's spirits. And, you know, that these groups are getting bigger, but it's still hard to be the only one. I'm sure I'm not the only person in the room who was the only one on my course, the only black one, the only black female in the room, the only black person in the room, and giving them those experiences along the way so that they get used to coping um, with those situations. Um, it is, like you said, unfortunate. You know, um, my own daughter is in her third year of university and I can remember trying to find the P60 and the this and the that to, to prove who I was in support of her application. It is, it is a hard process. I do agree with you there, um, Ambrose. And again, it's designed to stop our young people from, from studying, isn't it? And we've just got to be supportive as a community. I think as you were talking, it reminded me that, you know, with the erosion of organizations like Connections, the advice being given to our young people in some schools is less and less. Um, you know, we had quite a sound careers advice. I remember when I first arrived in Leicester on Charles Street, there was a, a double building donated, um, delegated to Connections and careers advice. I'm helping young people across the city in year 11 now. And they're like, oh, I might study this and I might study that. And, you know, the careers guidance that was once actually ironically an Ofsted criteria, carers, um, care and guidance, is, it's been eroded away. It's all about GCSE score, GCSE score. But if you don't know what you need to attain to get to the next level, then it's quite hard to set that target and to try and achieve that um, target, you know, using smart targets that are measurable and achievable without knowing what education. So, you know, we're even 
in some ways worse off than we were when people were given the wrong guidance. There's literally no guidance in some schools. I am a year 10 form tutor and my year 10s went to an event last week um, where they met other year 10s from across the city and they said, oh, miss, we're the only school that still does work experience. And that as well has been eroded away um, with COVID. It couldn't happen for the last two years, but it's such an important life skill that, you know, that one week in year 10, even if it means you eliminate that as a career, it's still an educational experience. But, you know, the loss of careers, guidance and work experience is detrimental to our young people as well. Did, yes, yeah, um, I, yeah, I was going to say the same. And yeah, without the work experiences, you know, a lot of young people are not even able to make even very good career choices as well. Because what the work experience would have done is they would have been able to go out there, do experience um, a lot of work experiences, then be able to make the choices in terms of what they want to study in the university but when that is not done they obviously i understand the impact of covid but when that is not there for them it is difficult and a lot of these young people don't have the family connection or anybody that will help them to you know at least bridge those barriers that are stopping them from getting you know get to the next level um really so it is difficult. And a lot of children, I know so many young people that have dropped out of university because of finances, their families cannot afford it. They themselves cannot afford it. And sometimes immigration as well puts, um, you know, some children that have been here for a very long time. I, a particular young girl I met recently, she's been here a very long time. She, she was actually born here, but her parents, papers have not just been sorted out and so that's actually now impacting on her so she's applied to the university to study and when it came to finances she's not able to then go ahead because she was told that she's not entitled to home fees and everything and this is somebody that was born here but because of her parents um, status she's not able to then progress and she didn't have any choice but to then drop out of um, her course, which is quite unfortunate, really. And, 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 and in circumstances like that, not only does she drop out, but uh, she also has that debt that will follow her. It's not written off. Absolutely, yeah. Even when later on it is found that, you know, she was eligible for student, for a student loan anyway, she will still have that debt that will follow her. Exactly, so, yeah. <clears throat> And again, because of the poor careers guidance, um, some young people, once there's a deadline, something like third week in October, if you haven't withdrawn from your course by then, you pay the full year's fees. Um, and, you know, with the way that the world works now, lots of university lecturers are sessional. So I had a young lady that was studying teaching in Northampton just up the road, but she would arrive to get some support and the tutor wouldn't be there. Then she'd arrive again to get some support and the tutor wouldn't be there. I mean, luckily she had a very supportive family. So she came back to Leicester owing a year's fees and leaving in October, but restarted because she had that supportive home environment. I, I heard about another young man this weekend that, you know, with the effects of COVID found it really hard to get part-time work. And like Miss is saying, because they feel they need to work, 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 to supplement um, the loan. The loan doesn't pay for your accommodation or food for the year at all. So most students have to work and they kind of get into that trap where they're working more hours and they're given more hours and they're working more hours and they're given more hours. Um, I just had a look at the statistics and only 45% of young black people go on to university. Um, it has increased over the last 20 years or so from 23% but up to 45% in, in 2019. In um, Chinese families and heritage, it's up to 68%. And in Asian families, it's up to 50%. So, you know, it's a lot of debt. And what we have is, you know, even where you have successful parents who are both working, the cost of the fees alone means that to support them in supported living while they're studying, everybody has to work. 
Yes, yes, Councillor. Yes, she's she's hundred percent right. Um, I I have seen many children like they also study and they go to work even if it's work experience, if it's a paid work while they work and they also do the part time study and then also they have got different talents as I said in my speech that the talents that they've got is it, that talents like um, doing dramas and um, teaching, as she said. Um, they also teach and they learn. They teach and they learn. And that's how they also make money. I've, I've come across I've, as many children or many students, if I say people, they, they have got quite good talents. If they have that as in their, when they have a loan to study further, they would go quite further and they, they can, when they have a loan, and once they've, they've finished their education, they can repay the loan and they, they carry on along with their education, the degree and the talents that they've got in like music and so on, if I say. I've seen many um, doing their drama here and elsewhere in, in the world, they go abroad I've seen a, there's a group called um, from the MATV, there was a Brambat, and they've got a very good, a big group. And they also do drama here on stage in Leicester, and they also go to America. They've, they've been there four times, and now they, they really go every year. And they, as she said, the parents do give um, some sort of education and some money from their pocket, although they have to do the overtime at their work, but obviously they want their children to be educated. But once they, they can get onto their feet, they can repay the loan, they can earn the money, and also they've now got their own education in their hand and in their head that they've been to uni and they've got good education with degree. So yes, She's hundred percent right. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, and and also the the report uh, mentions apprenticeships. Uh, the section on education and training mentions apprenticeships, but then at the same time, you know, it doesn't really talk about uh, the ch the challenges that come with uh, with the apprenticeship system, where where, where racism actually is in play right from recruitment to training to retention to progression. Uh, in your view, what should be done to, to, to improve the apprenticeship system that, uh, that is in place in Leicester and also in the UK in general? Yes, Councillor. Racism is everywhere, if I say, not just UK or Africa or India or anywhere. Racism is everywhere. Ah, uh, Councillor Panya is, 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 is frozen. While we wait for her to come back, maybe Julie and Stephanie, you could pick this up. Yes, Julie. I'm happy for Stephanie to go first. Um, <laughs> in terms of, of your, like, um, so recently I had um, a 16 year old girl because um, PwC, um, KPMG, most of these big four accounting firm had um, put an advert for their um, apprenticeship program and she doesn't want to go to university she wants to go through the apprenticeship routes and it was through conversation with myself that you know she found out about it because she wasn't aware of it it wasn't something that was discussed in her school so she after a conversation with her i sent her the links and we 
you know, I supported her to make the application and uh, she didn't get any response and um, positive response from um, all of them. But then again, somebody that she knows was able to get into um, these programs, um, you know. So I looked at, you know, what was wrong. I just couldn't tell what she had done wrong. She's a 16 year old you know, who wants to go down through the apprenticeship route. Yes, it wasn't discussing school. I think school needs to do more anyway um, in terms of um, supporting young people, knowing that actually they have that option because a lot of children, the reason why they don't want to go to university is the debt that they're going to incur after they finish university. So I think if apprenticeship route is promoted more um, in school, then that can help a lot of young and more young people. But the thing is this, that's not easily accessible to them. A lot of them are not aware that, you know, they can go down through their apprenticeship route. Then obviously, I know from experience, most children in private schools, they tend to, independent schools, they tend to obviously encourage them to go through this route. And those offers and opportunities are available um, to them. So what is it that they're doing that cannot be replicated in the state education system so that more young people can go down this route, knowing that they don't have to worry about the university fees and the debts that they're going to incur after universities? You actually said it yourself, Stephanie. It's about the networks, isn't it? It's not what you know, it's who you know. And that's what we see. Um, with apprenticeships um, from our young white working class boys. I know a young man that I met in the corner shop and he said, oh, miss, I'm doing my apprenticeship with my dad. Dad's a carpenter, I'm doing my apprenticeship through him. Dad's getting the tax benefits of having an apprentice who happens to be his own son. And that's what we're saying. So whilst our white working class boys are not also not doing as well at GCSEs, the networks that they have in place to secure an apprenticeship, especially in the trades, are very well established. Yeah, If you haven't got somebody in this city, you've got somebody in the neighbouring city, your uncle, your cousin, your brother-in-law, etc. Um, I have some very successful young people who've applied for apprenticeships um, at the sort of Siemens, Rolls-Royce um, levels to not have to pay the debt. But again, we're looking at, at three A's and, and some of those um, test centers are quite rigorous um, in terms of, of getting in through the door. Ironically, I went to a black business show in London last month and it was all about um, JP Morgan, the black bank. Well, the bank that's trying to improve its um, reputation in the black communities in America and the UK, they've actually established some finance apprenticeships as well and are trying to um, secure black students for those. And it's about us networking and it's about us challenging the people we bank with and the post office and, and everywhere else. Um, and that's what I was saying about the careers advice. My secondary school is still at LEA school and we have our own internal careers advisor. Whereas I know some of the other schools kind of um, contract that out and they'll have one careers event for their year 11s for the, for the whole year and the lack of work experience as well. So apprenticeships is definitely an area for, for development. But if you haven't done work experience, it's hard to put relevant experience on your CV and your application to secure an apprenticeship, isn't it? And, and I think that we need to insist that those things come back into schools. And then we, we hear from Katala Pandya and then open up for, for, for Q, Q and A. Sorry, I didn't catch you. So we're going to hear from you. And then uh, if anyone who is listening in the audience would like to say something or ask questions, they can ask after, after we hear from Councillor. Yes, as I was saying, sorry, I was disconnected somehow. So I've just um, left my link away. But yes, I will come back to this, that yes, young children do need um, work experience, as Julie said, they definitely do. Um, even if they do go for like their uh, half term holiday, or if they've got their Christmas holiday period or the school vacation, 
the school holiday and they can have an experience and they can also earn a little for the next year also for the next term and have some money in their hand and the experience that's how they um, that's how we educated ourselves but that did help but nowadays it's changed nowadays there are so many um, different talents see and they've got different people who can um, actually employ other like attempt works and they do they don't want people who haven't got ta talent see so yes they will just say okay we will let you know next week or the week after and that's how they have other, another a person been employed and people challenge so that challenge has to be worked out properly thank you thank you um Ab abdika you wanted to say something Yes, uh, thanks, Amos. Uh, I was just listening. This is a really very informative and very encouraging uh, conversation. Thank you for organizing. First of all, yeah. my name is uh, Abdi Kepara. I am the CEO of Somali Community Balance Association here in Lasta. And a lot of things that have been discussed today is actually what we been exposed to or experienced in day to day. And that from our you know, uh, uh, members of our community who you were know, exposed to different schools in Rasta. So thank you uh, again to Leah and uh, Stephen and uh, uh, Van der Beachy, Rosoma, for your uh, input and insight moment. Yeah. Uh, really, uh, racism is a you know, everyday experience for our community as a black person, particularly when you have a multi-sectional issue, you know, uh, boxes that you have to be being implied, Muslim, you know, you get more likely to be even targeted in different ways. Here we are talking about the racism that we experience as a black, and there's a really big last experience I have uh, done some uh, data analysis for fixed term exclusion for Somali, actually, uh, the last secondary schools, 2016. And we found out, you know, five schools that we have done uh, Mold, Modeli, Bamington, Sobali, Crown Hills. I think it was five secondary schools in Leicester. We looked at the data and uh, highly, you know, the fixed term exclusion was highly disproportionate compared to other ethnic uh, groups like uh, British India. And that was extreme. And actually, we bring together those, we invited in a discussion to those uh, principals in those schools. And I think Madani didn't come, but all other, and Crown Hill at the time, but three came and they really wanted to do something about it. And we presented this data. And, and still, it was hard to get even data after that from the last week or so. So we can, you know, benchmark and see if any improvement has been done since. And, and a church window, for example, now the consular mentioned the church window. And my question I will ask it, the consular is, you know, that experience you discussed it in church window, was that a racism related or what is it? Because we have a cases where church window actually is a recent case. A black child was beaten in a bus, school bus, with a group of students and in 10 minutes. And uh, actually, uh, it's uh, sad, it happens in, yeah, and that the black child goes to that school. Uh, and they experience, you know, racism and beating from other minorities. Apparently, you know, uh, a lot of uh, area we live, Asian is at the majority of those area and schools. And, you know, a lot of our community members actually report, they feel that they've been, uh, you know, discriminated or racism. 
So I wanted to know what this in judgment or what this is special, what is in that scrutiny. Is that the racism related or any other issues? That's my question to the to the counselor. Is it to me? Yes. Okay. The Jewish Meadow had um, um, few, uh, a bunch of um, children, and they did say they'd allow Akbar. But then <laughs> it was been solved straight away. That came to our council as well when we've had a meeting. And um, it wasn't just myself only. Um, there, there were quite a few other um, people said the same thing as well. But that was only... Um, the one I knew, and when I said that to other people, and they said that it was straight away been solved. So obviously it was, it was being resolved just there and there. So it wasn't just one community or one person, it was just a bunch of them, and they all were being trained somehow. But then obviously I've, I've heard that they, the problem was being solved straight away. So how, what, uh, what did you glass it that uh, incident then, even though it happened, was it racism or was it uh, hatred I, or Islamophobia? Or I what? wouldn't say it was a racism. I wouldn't say anything else. It was just like young children who just kept saying one word all the time, but it wasn't being trained or it wasn't being um, racism. I wouldn't say it was, there was any racism at all because it was being solved straight away. So I, I can't say it was racism. If it was, then it would have been taken a long time to resolve or to be challenged as well. So it was solved, the problem was solved straight away. And second day, everybody um, were entered into the same classroom. But that is a non, are they Muslims? Who are they? Are they That's what I've that's what I've heard, but I, I don't actually have any report. Sorry. Sorry. And, and, uh, is there anyone else who, who wants to say something or ask a question? Okay, so in, in that case, maybe we, we go to uh, submissions and uh, end notes. We go back to our to our speakers. Are they no, no, knowing that what we've been doing or what we've been trying to do is to look at what uh, the civil report says about education and training, and uh, also drawing on your experiences and on the work that you've been doing. Uh, is there anything in the civil report that is uh, useful? Uh, knowing that also there are things in the report that are problematic, uh, what would you say localities or communities, how do you think communities should respond in especially paying particular attention to issues around education and training? Um, like I said earlier on, I think some of the, you know, some of the recommendations um, from the report, um, you know, um, can be said that, you know, to be useful because what he had done is he, he highlighted some of the things that need to be done to address the inequalities that do exist, um, you know, um, as a whole. Then, um, and when you look at the report, I think in one of the recommendations, uh, actually, when you look at the broad theme, is looking at, say, you know, building trust. Um, however, we now know that this report has not been able to do that. I think the government and the key stakeholders probably need to get to the, you know, start all over again and find a way how they're going to build the trust and, um, you know, repair some of the, um, the distress and the issues that this report has actually created. Once that has been done, then that's when the recommendations can then be implemented and that trust, you know, they can start building the trust and uh, heal, 
you know, some of the raw, raw wounds that, um, that have been unnecessarily been opened, you know, within the ethnic minority um, communities by this um, report. And they have to acknowledge that, that there is institutional racism and that actually it is very damaging and it has a negative impact um, on, on a lot of people. And it does um, create a lot of problems for them. Then that way, then they will be able to start then addressing some of the issues. Thank you. Um, I think going forward, we've got to go back to the McPherson report that talked about having a curriculum that's reflective of our communities. Um, and actually, you know, our teachers and our pupils are quite keen to update our curriculum. When the um, new national curriculum was introduced, all texts <laughs> that were non-white English were removed from the English curriculum. And our, our young people are finding it hard to engage, you know, with these 1920s and Inspector Calls, your Shakespeare of Macbeth, um, where it's all a very white world. And, and you know, because we have no African authors, you know, there is no Chinya Achebe or Wale Sayanka, but we have narrowed that curriculum. And some of our exam boards actually over the last 12 months have gone back to more inclusive English literature texts because they're realizing that they're disengaging our young people. Um, as a scientist, I always try and build in relevant examples. And I'm very lucky that I work in a school where the vast majority of staff are either ethnic minorities themselves or people who work with largely ethnic minority children and recognize the need to present them with positive role models in, in science, none of which did I learn about in, in my science curriculum either. And I think as parents, we have a voice, we are stakeholders and we, and we need to challenge the curriculums. We as teachers need to be involved in, in reviews of curriculums and, and giving, um, giving our input actually at that level. Yes, becoming examiners so that when, when we're consulted on the next curriculum, we, we get a say so. We need to be more strategic. I think that in the Leicester African heritage communities, we have mobilized during lockdown and we have the African Heritage Alliance meetings, one of which has an education branch, um, very experienced head teachers working there as well. Um, and we need to be supportive of movements in our community. Um, we had a Leicester Black Pound event. <laughs> Um, last month at the African Caribbean Center, and that some of the lessons to be learned from, from the tragedies over, over lockdown. So going forward, I think we need to make sure that we, our voice continues to be heard um, and that we strategize um, and make sure we're represented in those governing bodies, um, in those magistrates' courts, you know, in those council chambers so that we can truly effect change. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Padia. Yes, definitely. Um, everybody's voice is always been heard in council and surely will be heard. Thank you. So, so this event uh, is taking place as part of the eighth annual Leicester Human Rights Arts and Film Festival. The festival continues We've got another event tomorrow and uh, another one the following day, right through to the 10th of December. The festival, like I said at the beginning, runs from the 4th of December and ends until the 10th. And uh, the reason why we do this is because we want to encourage people to engage with human rights issues. We don't define, the festival doesn't define home, it doesn't define abroad. It is uh, mindful that uh, we live in Leicester. Leicester is, a, is a possibly a world city. We've got someone from everywhere who called this place home. Uh, and also this particular event that has been looking at what the CO report says about uh, education and training is part of a series where we've looked at, in the past, we've looked at uh, health. We've also looked at policing. And uh, next, we are going to, to look at, at employment. So 
I will say thank you very much for attending and uh, please look at uh, the program for the Leicester Human Rights Arts and Film Festival. Maybe there are other events that might be of interest to you. If they are, uh, attend if you can. Uh, thank you and uh, have a good evening. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah.